We're going to go on to the next panel, and um, I will turn it over to Shin, who is the chair of this panel, where we're going to basically be discussing data and okay. data analytics. Okay, so thanks for everyone to come. Thanks especially for Tanya for the hard work of putting and the idea of with Thalia, <coughs> having everything. So I'm just the one that was doing small, small things behind, but really, it's Tanya and Talia who's doing everything. Don't so, believe her. <laughs> so the, the data analytics is, um, I think I'm from in, uh, academia, and uh, we had a meeting in Berkeley last year, and the title was basically, What is Big Data? And it was a three-day or two-day conference, I forgot. And at the end of the day, I think none of us still know the answer, what is big data. Um, so I think it's a very interesting and really hard topics uh, in both academia and, uh, and industry in terms of job recruiting and in many aspects. It's really something that is going to be there. But if we actually look at this data, is really sitting in the crossroad of the traditional mass finance and the uh, future mass, uh, of financial mathematics. And also is where the tech industry and the finance industry are also getting really head-to-head -head competitive in terms of recruiting, in terms of many, many aspects, which is also very good for students because now you have a um, you are sitting in a place where you can go either way with this uh, educational background. But then, having said that, I think it's really very important for us to have this panel to hear experts from cross-discipline and then to really see, according to their experience, how they grow in their career to such a successful uh, position, how they grow with the industry and how they view about data and data analytics. And so I would say start with the, uh, Rosie with the question of, uh, first of all, can you introduce yourself and how you see yourself in this uh, growing area and how the industry grows in the background of this big data? Okay, my name is Rosie Macedo. I work for QS Investors. We spun out of Deutsche Bank several years ago. We're independent for a number of years and are now a leg mason company. My role there is Chief Investment Officer. I fell into finance by accident as a part-time job. I was you know, good with computers and numbers. I had overspent on some travel I did. So while I was working as an engineer full-time doing laser Doppler velocimetry, I took on a part-time job coding at night for First Quadrant here in Pasadena way back when. And that, within a few months, became my full-time job because it was far more exciting because every day you'd get an answer in the markets as to what you did, and it moved a lot faster in practice than engineering, design, and testing in research would move. So it was a very fortuitous shift for me because shortly after, I made the decision to drop everything I'd ever studied and go into this whole new field I knew nothing about, my old field had the bottom fallout from under it when the entire aerospace industry in Southern California went down. So I was very lucky in that timing. I've basically been in it ever since, and it's fascinating every day in terms of what's happening and getting new data and new information to test against your ideas about how things worked. And every day that question comes up, was I right, was I wrong, did I forget something, what else is going on here? in the data. When I think of big data, I really view that as massive amounts of data, so much more than what we use and what I do from day to day, which does not mean it's not relevant. Certainly, high frequency trading, you have that massive data size, but also in some of the new research signals that are being created, when you start talking about text analysis and looking through the SEC filings, looking for sentiment indicators. We are very much at the tip of the iceberg of what we can do with text. I mean, it is so unbelievably rudimentary counts of happy words and sad words, and those are our sentiment indicators for companies. 
when you can easily imagine that once you start doing things like throwing the thesaurus at news stories to simplify the language, doing actual pattern recognition for when you've seen these types of stories before for other kinds of companies, building in things about the relationships among companies, and really being able to mine massive amounts. That to me is one of the most exciting potential areas for big data to what we all do in terms of understanding how the markets are thinking about um, different asset classes, different stocks, the, the political situation going on in different countries. Um, let me direct you all to look at things like the political uncertainty index that's being created now from uh, you know, relatively sophisticated text analysis for right now, but I think that's only going to increase over time. So circling back to what I do, I'm very excited that there are very smart people working on these problems because I think these will be great signals. Day to day, I work on the buy side. At my table, it was made clear that not everyone here knows what that means. So Sam sat here and talked about being at the USC endowment as the asset owner. It's their money. They would come to someone on the buy side to go invest their money for them. And when I go to do that to buy and sell the stocks or ETFs or whatever it is we're putting in their portfolio, I talk to someone on the sell side, the brokers. So for those of you in academia, sell side, brokerage firms, buy side asset managers, owners, pension funds, endowments, incredibly wealthy people, whoever on that. Um, our data tends to be anywhere from 10 years to 50 years to in some cases 100 years of data depending on our horizon. And very often it's monthly. Sometimes we're dealing in a quarterly time frame, sometimes in a weekly or daily. We don't deal in minutes or tick by tick for what I do. So in the grand scheme of things, that's relatively little data even when you multiply it by, let's say, 5,000 stocks globally. Um, so not what I would properly think of as big data, but I do think big data is going to increasingly impact what we're doing in terms of trying to forecast different asset classes and markets and that it behooves everyone to pay attention to what signals are being developed there. Great. My name is Isa Watson. I um, have a little bit of a different background than most of the speakers here today. So I started my career out as a chemist. I was a chemist um, in discovery research at Pfizer where I synthesized treatments for diabetes. And I moved on from the research side to the clinical side um, where I started out as a clinical trial strategy just analyst. And my position eventually morphed into, um, I guess, analyzing a lot of large data sets to kind of understand a bit more and inform a bit more the types of strategies that we should have for, for clinical trial placement all across the world. Um, and so after I spent some years doing that, I actually went to business school and got my MBA. There are a lot of MIT people here. Um, I'm one of them as well, study econ and finance. And I ended up at JP Morgan Chase. So I started out there doing strategy for the wealth management division. Um, then I was asked to move out to Hong Kong to figure out what our retirement um, solution strategy should be for Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore, which was a really interesting experience. I moved back from Hong Kong actually at the end of last year, and now I work in the strategy and business development um, part of business banking. So I, I lead a lot of strategic analytics for business banking. And just to give you the lay of the land, business banking at J.P. Morgan Chase is the part of the business that serves two and a half a million American small businesses delivering deposit, lending, and cash management products. So you can imagine that you know there's a lot of strategic analytics that can go into a role like that to inform very high level, you know, senior management type of strategies. And to the point about big data versus data analytics, I, I do see it, see it as a little different. So big data, to Rosie's point, I don't think we're anywhere near where we could be, right? We're, we're going to be much further along in five years and much further along in 10 years. And I think that one of the big hindrances to big data previously is the fact that the quality of data just has not been there. You know, and it, it gets better actually every year, every six months. You know, I'm more comfortable, more comfortable with the types of data that I'm seeing. Um, and essentially, I 
big data, you, I see it as more of a research type of approach, right? And you don't see it as ingrained in a lot of companies that have to answer to shareholders or have to be efficient. And what I mean when I say that is, is in big companies, I find that you leverage a lot of what I call data analytics. And it's a bit more targeted. It's a bit more trying to solve for an immediate term solution. I want to launch a product. Is this the right product to launch? Let's find the data that gives us insights into consumer behavior, into the demand for the product. Those are the types of things that we do in data analytics. And you have to, you know, communicate that up to senior management so we can so they can make decisions about, you know, the approach we like to take. Big data is a bit more, you know, large scale and research oriented than that. And my personal opinion actually is that, you know, from an academic perspective on big data, I think there's a huge opportunity to collaborate uh, with practitioners who don't necessarily have the resources or the right talent internally to, you know, really address the big data type of problems. So that's my background and that's what I would initially say about the industry. Okay, no, <clears throat> excuse me. So it's my turn. So my background, I think my career really evolved together with the evolution of uh, financial maths to a great degree. So I got my PhD in 99 in mathematics and <clears throat> I was doing stochastic analysis. And be before that, I was thinking of doing, you know, harmonic analysis and uh, uh, differential geometry. And then 95 to 99, many of you probably knew that uh, at that time, math was math and physics was so difficult subject to find a job. It was just very difficult for academic jobs. And so I slowly moved to stochastic analysis and then moving to controls and then doing a little bit of uh, financial math. And that landed me a job in IBM research. And then I switched to, um, to Cornell, and then there I started more focused on credit risk. That was really the hot topic in credit risk from 2001 to 2008 or 9 until the crashes comes. And then, um, then I moved to Berkeley, and now I'm doing what is really hard now in high frequency trading. So my career has been really starting from the math as a basic background and then started on top of all the major topics in finance and then myself have to learn to adapt to, to the field because if you don't adapt in terms of academic field in mass finance, I think it's going to die if it's too in disintegrated from the industry. So this is, and then when I, so I'm a professor so not only I have to adapt my research, but I'm also very conscious of educating my students because I'm always worried about their, their, their placing their hand on me for the next three or four years doing PhD thesis with me, but I always feel very responsible for their whole career. The next 10 years of their career is basically in my hand, so I have to also try to be adaptive in getting them uh, used to um, the new field. And what I see now in terms of high frequency trading is really a perfect, perfect subject for them to learn because they get this training in very sophisticated mathematics and stochastic, stochastic analysis. And in the meantime, they get this data that we have a small lab. We got the data from NASDAQ, about 10 terabytes. It's not that big, it's pretty big. And uh, we got the student try to come in, cleaning a little bit data, download the data. It's such an easy word to say, but to even download it in the right way, it takes months to do it. So the student gets experience with the data and they do a little bit simple statistics and they take a course with me. And they got a job in terms say, in Citadel, in all the JP Morgan, everything. And then they end up going to Facebook and Google. <laughs> And I view it's a positive because this way they are really trained to be very hedged. We are in finance, we know hedge. They really hedge against all possible really important industry. And so this is where I feel it's really a job opportunity and also a good career to be in in financial math. So I, in my mind, big data in fact helped the educational aspect of the financial math because it really broadened the, the horizon of it. But then, this is just my, my little 
private plan all the time to do it, but then I also wanted to get the panel from the industry perspective about what your views about the big data or data analytics in terms of the component, in the, the co educational component that you could provide some advice to the student of what you think you would want to hire and, and what kind of skills you would be looking for and the students should be prepared for that. So maybe first? some advice? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, it's funny, I got this question earlier today, and I don't have a very specific answer. I'm not looking for people that have taken stochastic math or differential equations. Really, when it comes to big data, it's really about strategic thinking, right? And when it comes to data, you're really in it to answer a problem, right? And so my question is always, you know, are you able to bounce back and forth between this 1,000 foot view and the 40,000 foot view? Because when you're off doing, you know, your analyses, it's really important to have to bounce back and forth just to make sure that you're extracting the right level of, of detail and relevant detail. And so, you know, when I think about the people that I work with, I studied chemistry and math in undergrad. I launched my career as a chemist. No one on my team has that background. And if they said, oh, we only wanted people with a math background, I probably wouldn't have been hired, right? And so I think that whatever it is that you do, um, really make sure you are you know, making sure you can communicate the strategic relevance. Um, and then whatever question it is that you're trying to answer, what are the four things that you need to know to come up with that answer and to be comfortable with it? And one of the things that I realized, you know, transitioning from more on the academic side and the science side to more so kind of data in a large corporation is the fact that when I was in academics, you know, when I, I published my first paper in science, I think I was like 20, right? And when I submitted for publication, you know, I had to prove five different ways that I, I synthesized that one compound you know, to, to essentially 100% certainty, right? And the thing is with data analytics, you will never ever be 100% confident with the answer that you come up with, with your, you know, conclusion, with your preliminary conclusion. And I think that's something that people have to be very conscious of, right? You move from a background where you know you can prove with nuclear magnetic resonance, with mass spec, with um, you know different types of analyses that you have what you have, and then you're moving to something where I think this is it, but it's based on past behavior. I don't know what the market's going to do tomorrow. I don't know how consumers are going to behave tomorrow, right? I can just say that you know, given what I do know this is what I propose. And that's really difficult for a lot of people. So I would say that, you know, if, you're, if this is something that you're really looking to transition into, be, be comfortable with the uncertainty. You know, you can't freak out about it, you just have to approach it with a bit of diligence. Um, but like strategic thinking, communication is huge. And that was another thing I learned in science. It was really interesting, you know, being a chemist, having to speak to biologists versus physicists, versus my material scientists, I communicated differently to all three um, people because their vantage points were different, right? And so when you go into an interview, I think that you know, the biggest pitfall for people who are in the data you know, space, and they touched on this on the communications panel, and I think it's of great importance, is the ability to, to communicate the why, the so what. Every time someone on my team brings me a, an analysis and a, a page, a, uh, but so what? What does this tell me? You know, does this tell me that we should price higher? Does this tell me that consumers would do this? You know, and I think that everything you you do, you bring to light. Always have to ask yourself this: so what? And make sure everyone else is comfortable with the fact that you understand that. I had to smile when you said, "Get used to the lack of certainty in things," because I was once asked, "What?" I thought made me a good portfolio manager back when I was doing that. And I said, oh, easy, I can make a decision as soon as I'm 51% sure of something. <laughs> <laughs>
a buyer and sell. I, 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 don't, I didn't need that great certainty because at some point you recognize you just don't have that in these markets. Um, one thing I'll say in interviews is, you know, if you're going to go to an interview and say you're really interested in X or you're passionate about X or you have a lot of experience with something, and do it. Just do it. Don't wait for permission. Go do it. I was so excited. We had someone interviewing for a job at my firm who had incredible big data experience, like real big data with all the new algorithms. And I thought, oh, this is great. This is such a different angle from what my current team has. And this candidate had been at a large bank with lots of data. And I said, well, tell me about what you've been doing. OK, but where's the big data in that? Oh, I haven't done that. I said, but, but you, you have all the data right there, and that, that's your skill set. Oh, well, I wasn't assigned that. Seriously, how interested are you in something if you're not curious enough to get into it and explore it on your own, especially when someone has just handed you all of this data to go look at? So find something that you love enough that you're going to tinker with it on your own when given the opportunity to that. And go talk to people about doing that, because that is the level of passion that I want to see. I think someone earlier talked about ambition. I would say, for my team, more passion and curiosity. But it's a bit of ambition, too, right, to go off on your own and research something in addition to what you've been asked for as the magic ingredient with all these people who can do great math, right, who have all these skills. What's going to make the difference? It's going to be, do you love it enough to do it in your spare time? Can you find the angle, the interesting thing there? So I'm still looking for that person who has that big data experience and skill set, who is tinkering around with exactly how to apply it on financial data, because I think that could be very, very cool. Hey, Sharon, I just want to make one more point yeah, sure. on that. Um, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, yes. So anytime you're given a model, take it, break it, rebuild it. Take it, break it, and rebuild it. How many of you guys are very comfortable with Excel? I mean, anyone work in it or whatever data programs that you guys use? A lot of times when you're given big data, you're given it in a certain format. And I think the, you know, it is that ambition and getting in there. But essentially, if you take it and you just make it your own, you're able to capture really interesting insights. And when you're working with a lot of senior people, people that have 30, 25 years of experience, a lot of times the reasons that they make certain decisions is because it's always been done that way. But it doesn't mean that it's the right way to do it, right? And they didn't have the data that you have to really inform those decisions. And so I think that's a, that's a huge opportunity and, you know, being able to play with it and capture those insights is really critical to, to adding value to kind of how our business and decisions evolve. And let me add on to that, the, the break it part, whatever you think is the great new idea, test that and then test the opposite. Because it's even more powerful when you can show if, if you follow this idea, here's the benefit. And oh, by the way, just as added proof, if you do the opposite, here's how much worse things get. That is yep. so very powerful to do that kind of breaking, among other kinds of breaking, is test the opposite of your hypothesis. And if it's not making the situation worse, maybe you need to rethink what the mechanism is that's going on and what it is you're looking at in your data. Tanya, do you have something to add on that? Um, well, I think, I think the perspective of actually really being thoughtful about the data and then testing your things, some of the conversations at lunch at the tables were, um, in some cases, frustration over not being able to share ideas that people were having or to pursue them. 
Um, and I think, you know, kind of going to Rosie's point and, and Isa's points too about working in the organization, I mean, organizations want to hear the value added. I mean, as long as you're getting the real job done that you're being slated to do, and you've been careful with the proof that, you know, Maggie talked about, which is that if you're being asked to do something you think is the wrong question, being able to communicate well why it's something else, but assuming it is a valid question, um, there's a lot to be gained in your career advancement over spending some extra hours on doing the counterexample or studying the data to see if actually there's a new way to think about it because chances are the older decisions that were made in the past, and remember, we're talking about dark ages that are 20 years ago here, okay, in, in the world of data analytics and computational power. So the ability to actually make decisions with a greater data set do very frequently lead to different answers. And I think your expectation should be that that's the case versus the counterexample. And that should always encourage you to spend that extra time. Um, the only thing I will add to that is when you do come up with that clever thing, um, help your boss to own that. Don't try to go and own that <laughs> yourself, especially if you're young, because that is sort of a bad approach. So, <laughs> And as a boss, if someone did all the work for your genius idea, just give them all the credit. They yeah. did all the work. Right. Yeah. I, I should add that. So <clears throat> if you're smart enough to come up with such a brilliant idea that somebody is willing to steal it, have confidence in yourself that sooner or later you're going to come up with even bigger ideas when you have the control over it. Mm -hmm. okay, that's very important. Just let it go and don't just waste your energy. So I, I, in terms of data and how it's helpful for career landing in industry and everything, I think it's also, if you're a student like some of you are here, it's so important that you go to just go get your hands on the data and instead of looking at the existing models where your advisor give you a paper, you read a paper, you're trying to come up, break your head to, to come up with a model. If you have the data, you get such a tremendous insight in it and you're not going to run out of ideas of coming up with new model because suddenly you see what's wrong with the model and what's the positive side of the model and it becomes so much easier to be creative in the research as well. And that's really gets yourself very well prepared, whatever the career in down the road you're going to choose, whether research-wise or, or yeah. industry-wise. And one of the largest areas of hiring right now in academic positions in industry, um, buy side and sell side, is data scientists. It's, yeah. it's just enormous, just yeah. enormous. And, and if you're actually able to not only do some of the lifting of the data and the analysis, but you know, as, as Isa and Rosie and, and Shin are pointing out, to actually be able to do some interpretation of it and then communicate about it, um, you're going to have a very successful career in a, in a fast growing area. So it's, it's definitely an area to look at if you haven't sort of put your stake down yet and you're looking for somewhere. Okay, so <clears throat> I have another question that's also related to data. Basically now, Financial math in the uh, academic world, we know we are at a crossroad. And now the question is, what do we see um, the most challenging issues now from an industry perspective that uh, in, the, in this area and how the data analysis and everything is coming into play? So I have two challenges which are fairly prosaic by their nature. and. One is related to too little data. We're just coming out of a period of rates, big secular decline in interest rates. What's going to happen next? They're going to go up. How do I make decisions about what to do as a quant, model-driven quant, when in a lot of my data sets, I have no period during which interest rates rose? The last time we saw a big rise in interest rates ended in September 1981. An awful lot of the ETF say, or things that we work with now, didn't exist then. So can I come up with backfill data for that? How do I get a sense of what's going to happen when rates rise? Very hard to model. Back to the point earlier, go out and talk to people, right? Think about your data. Does your data 
your backwards looking data makes sense for the circumstances that are coming up in the future, do a sanity check on that. Um, even if you think it probably does make sense, certainly what we're seeing now with the interest rate environment is a big change. A lot of our data does not go back all that far. Talk to the fundamental analysts. Talk to some economists. Start thinking about how else might you tackle this problem. And don't be so um, isolated in quant world that you never talk to people who don't crunch numbers. Talk to the people who really think about these things. Talk up to economic historians who maybe span centuries and they're thinking about how things work. Try to get inputs from people with perspectives, with different backgrounds, not like you, because we don't always have all the data we need to do what we need to do for clients. If we stick with the data we have, we can very often uh, misapply it. So if you're just going to be looking at a period of falling interest rates, trying to forecast what's about to happen a period of rising interest rates, you could go very badly wrong with that if you, you're not very thoughtful about how you're going to do that. My other prosaic problem is how we measure risk does not align with how we experience risk. It makes a big difference to the end investor whether the downside happens randomly, well spaced out, or all bunched up together. I would love to talk to anyone here who has interesting ways of optimizing around measures like max drawdown, average drawdown, otherwise known as the pain index, the ulcer index, but the things that people, investors, really care about as opposed to these theoretical risk measures that, ah, it's all the wash in the long run. The thing is we don't get to live in the long run, right? You're trying to hang on to your clients this month, this quarter, this year and people are experiencing that financial pain in the very short term, and simply going to a short-term risk model is not quite capturing the same thing. So I think of this as a fairly prosaic problem, but it has a lot of implications for what you might do in someone's portfolio. And if you can get greater client satisfaction, then you can get them to stick with a sensible strategy longer, rather than shoot themselves in the foot by always going in the wrong direction at the wrong time. I would say that one of the challenges I've seen is from an operational perspective. So I think that it's an indisputable fact that big data can be very valuable um, on the academic side and also to us in industry. But I think there's a struggle with how is it that we actually incorporate that value into our business, right? And what does that collaboration look like? Is that an ongoing collaboration with a school like Berkeley and a lab like yours, Shen, or is that you know, I can, I can tell you that there are a lot of Silicon Valley startups that, you know, are in this big data space that are always calling and saying, hey, I have the answer to, you know, any problem that you have with my data, right? And so is that the solution? Because sometimes, you know, it, it can be very, you know, we can solve all your problems for $500,000, which, you know, in the grand scheme of things, <laughs> sounds pretty good, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but essentially, I think that industry has to figure out how do we best extract that value from big data? And I, I don't think that that's been figured out yet, and I think people are still kind of playing around well, with Well, and I think, I think the educational piece is huge there because if you didn't grow up as a quant handling all of this and knowing how to kick the tires, especially in finance, you've just gone through a period where your risk manager, we'll just call the risk manager Bob, was coming into the boardroom saying, the value at risk is 12 and everything's okay. And we're doing the same thing that everybody else is doing and the auditors were signing off on it and then it turned out everything wasn't okay. So maybe even though Bob was a PhD and brilliant, you can't just believe what these quants tell you. And now the data sets are even bigger, right? With big data and the analytics are even more complex. So I think there's going to be in any role that you take where you're in a quantitative function, the need to constantly instill confidence that you are well communicating the warning labels that should go with whatever numbers you're producing or whatever answer you're deriving from the data, right? I mean, on a pack of cigarettes, we have a warning label. It says if you smoke these, you could die. 
right? And with math analysis, many times you're making an assumption. If you've, if you've only looked, as Rosie said, at data that was in one direction during a period of intense you know, intervention by regulators, no volatility in the market, wacko correlations relative to other periods, then you need to make sure you're communicating that that's what's going on with these underlying data. So, so I think that that communication piece becomes more important. If you can do that, I think your career will zoom because you will help people to have confidence, frankly, in something they have to have confidence in. The financial markets cannot survive anymore without having a heavy quantitative and technological component. And so, so this isn't a problem that you can make go away by saying, oh, you know, I, I don't want to have, I don't want to have that. We have to have it. So, so I think it's great opportunities. And I think another challenge, and it kind of ties into that, Tanya, is being well-rounded is so important to having the right level of credibility. And well-rounded, like if you're kind of on the, the research side or the academic side is being well read you know going to conferences and extracting like different types of perspectives also making sure you're tied with industry and you're in tune with what business actually cares about because those things don't necessarily always align um, and, and, and if you're kind of focusing on data analytics within a large organization do you have the marketing perspective, the sales perspective, the risk perspective, the ops perspective because when I communicate you know, my conclusion or you know whatever my recommendation is all those perspectives have to be considered all of those people sit at the table and there is some way to kind of get to the middle but you have to make sure you're kind of well rounded and you know not necessarily well networked but you have con to consider all those perspectives and the budget perspective and the budget perspective yes <laughs> <laughs> right i mean why is it worth it to spend whatever it's going to cost to buy these big data and then to pay for these very expensive people to come and analyze them, right? So how do you think about that, I think, is also important. At a more basic level as well, by going to <coughs> conferences on different topics, I think one of the great difficulties is we all use different vocabulary, depending on what field we're in. It's the same underlying math, but you'd have no idea because they call it something else, right? <laughs> I am perpetually searching for solutions that have already been created. I just don't know what they called them. <laughs> in that other field that uses that math that I need. So being able to expose yourself, this idea of being very widely read and exposed, isn't so much that you're going to become an expert at all these other things, but you want to know what they call the things you do. So when you go to communicate to them your skill set, why it's great to have someone with this incredibly strong applied mathematical toolbox that you could say it in the words that they understand how it can impact them. And so maybe don't give the mathematical term for it, but give the term from that particular industry. And that's going to vary from place to place, from industry to industry. OK, so <clears throat> we have some questions. So I can have one more question. So one is, <clears throat> the other day we were talking about all the challenges from uh, a tech company and how Wall Street is slowly moving to Silicon Valley in some way in terms of the uh, recruiting the, the top talent. So the, the, the question is here is we are trying to understand what's your view about, say, down in the 10 years, 20 years, the, the finance industry, say, or the fintech or whatever. That's going to be the topic for the next panel, but maybe this is we can start it a little bit. Do you see? financial math or as a whole to sort of fade out a little bit and try to be merged in some way with the new technology and especially how do you see women because women we know we're trying to improve and do something to improve the percentage but women were less because he needs finance, he needs math, he needs physics and we don't have a lot of math and physics uh, females in it. Now, when we talk about uh, tech or data, we talk, of, talk about con computer science, which is equally bad in terms of having female students. So what you see this in terms of the competition of financial industry versus the other industry, and what's the future you, you see for women here? Well, very good, because you're here at this conference clearly getting advice from many of the best in the business. I see 
a continuing upward trend. We already have more women in university than men because the rate of increase in the percentage of women attending university has continued to go up while the rate of men attending has leveled off. Even in technical schools, you see much higher percentages now. Caltech is now almost 50-50. It's very close. When I was there, it was six to one. Um, That's certainly changing. I think the real trick is staying in the field, being um, continuing with it. Everyone has so many career changes in their life, generally, that just because the numbers in school are increasing doesn't necessarily mean someone sticks with it. That's going to come down to personal choices. And I know there were a lot of questions at the lunch table uh, that I was at about how to get the work-life balance and can you come back to your career after you take a break for whatever reason. And I think that's probably an area for a much more general conversation than this. I think there are a couple of competing things going on. We've got just this incredible flourishing of techniques and math and thinking and higher quality data and more of it that could be so fruitful. But getting back to something that was said earlier, the basic investment ship, it's a huge, huge ocean liner that moves very, very slowly just as we're getting to the point where a lot of papers are being put out there about how bad target date strategies are, that they are exactly the opposite of what they should be, that they become more conservative as you get older, which sounds very reasonable, except you end up dollar-weighted away from actually growing your money, right? and we're living longer and this is even worse and all these papers come out saying do the reverse strategy it's better do pretty much anything but what we do and it's better yet we're just at the point now where this is being um, mandated as the default option for people to follow these glide paths which every current paper says is the wrong thing to do things change very slowly in our industry and with the regulations that are out there and so you've got these two strains of we can do and learn more and more and be so sophisticated at one end, yet the traditional business itself and what matters to most people, let's say their retirement accounts, whether they manage them themselves and they increasingly are, the annuities, the what few pension plans are left, are very slow moving to change how they approach things and what they're doing. So on one side, I see hedge funds doing more and more exciting things over time. And on the other side, I see the potential for this very slow moving area that affects the most people to really get left behind. I know there's a panel coming up about ETFs and ETFs are very exciting in many ways, but really are people better off because they're trading ETFs? Because now I'm getting it in an ETF format versus some other format. My um, basic investment consideration isn't what form I'm getting these things in, but really should I be in them? How long should I have how much risk in order to have enough when I retire to survive and not eat cat food, right? It's a very basic problem. So great, tremendous growth and sophistication here. Very slow moving social systems around that. I actually think there's an upward horizon too. One of the things that I'll say and I mentioned a few minutes ago, decisions used to be made by a lot of intuition, and just because it was done that way for 30 or 40 years. But you'll see, you know, in a lot of these companies, at the very top level, you may still have some of that, but look at that next layer. You have a lot more data and analytics-oriented leaders. I know that when I have to speak to my CEO, I can't go to her and say, you know, I I think that this is okay because, you know, my stomach tells me that, you know, she, (laughs) I wouldn't have a job, right? You know, I think it's, I have to go to her with my assumptions, with what I considered, and this is, you know, the recommendation, and it was vetted by XYZ people, um, and, you know, there it is, right? And so I think that with that, and, you know, with you guys and developing the the data and analytic skill set, I think there's really a great opportunity to to really flourish. Another thing I'll say, though, is that you can use data to create opportunities for yourself, right? And so when you get in there, you mess with the data, you find really interesting insights, 
eventually you're going to catch someone's blind side. Okay, because when your boss or your boss's boss would have been, you know, doing something for a number of years and it may not be the right thing to do, you know, and I have been promoted quite a few times just on the fact that or I created bigger opportunities for myself because I noticed something, I picked up on something, I raised it, I say, hey, I think this may be an issue, maybe problematic, I want to build a team out to look at that. and. You know, it was an opportunity that I was given, right? And so be be optimistic and, you know, kind of ambitious in that regard. And the last thing I'll say is that, you know, the data analytics is just the foundational level. You know, that, that that's a given. You have to be really good at that. The second layer is that partnership, the ability to pull in other people's perspectives and to get other people's buy-in. Because your data really doesn't mean anything unless you have the buy-in. Um, and then the, the third layer of that is the communication. So all of that, you know, layered, I think that, you know, it's really a recipe to be very, very valuable, you know? And, you know, with women in particular, I do go into rooms, you all go into rooms where you're not, many people don't look like you, maybe one other person does. But it's an opportunity, right? You're different, and you can you can own that. And as as long as you come with those fundamental, you know, value adds, you know, people will pay attention to you and they'll listen to you. So actually, I think it's quite an advantage. Tanya, you have something to add? No, I think. We, do we have any <coughs> questions from the audience before okay. we? Because we're we're only have a, another few minutes on this panel. Does anybody have any questions before we make more comments? Um, one of the things that I'm interested in with data analytics intersecting with financial modeling, as you pointed out, it's not a perfect science. So as people interested in working in the quant space, is there anything that you would offer as words of caution towards maybe relying too heavily on it in, in like more of a data mining or overfitting sense? Is that something you're worried about? Or do you think it's more, more opportunity than it is something to be concerned about? I, I think I can reiterate many of the points that have already been made by people earlier today. You must have some intuition or understanding about what it is you're finding in the data. Why should it work? Why am I looking at this? Why should it work? Does this make sense? Think again, I, a number of people brought up, what were your assumptions in doing it about what the market environment was? Are those circumstances going to continue? And I think it's very easy to get in the habit of applying certain tools, and you tend to forget what your assumptions were uh, for using that tool in the first place because it's so habitual. There's a great piece by Cam Harvey that's come out fairly recently on how to correct for your what's known as a file drawer error. How many different things did you try? How many different factors? How many different ways did you look at the data? And he puts forward some very straightforward methodologies for correcting your statistics for that. Because if you explore your data enough times or enough different ways, you are, of course, going to find things. Um, if you think about the big quant crisis, the entire world is falling apart around the quants, and they're still applying these models that are based on average payoffs to factors. Really, what was it about the circumstances in 2008 and 2009 that were remotely like average circumstances on which all of those models were based. But they were so far removed from the underlying assumptions in what that model structure was that when none of those assumptions was true, and it was obviously not true, they're no longer thinking about what the initial assumptions were that went into that model uh, or a whole set of models. There are so many quants who at that point in time were applying average long-term average factor payoffs. That was their whole model in these circumstances that were nothing like long-term averages. So that um, reiterating the points, think about your assumptions, have some intuition behind what you're doing, and keep track of how many different tests you do and apply some of these corrections to give your sense a, a truer sense of significance or um, how many things you should take seriously after you've done 300 tests. Yeah, so um, I have a couple questions. Um, big data by now has been part of uh, 
the industry and also we see a lot of uh, effort in uh, science and in education. Um, is it uh, too early to comment on, uh, say, new models for asset prices that have emerged from what we have learned from big data? I really can't answer that question. <laughs> I, I think one thing I want to underscore was, was <coughs> Isa's point, and I think Rosie touched on this a little too, which is that we're still really doing data analytics mm -hmm. in yeah. the finance world. Yeah. And um, I think part of that is just where we are at the point that big data really came, which is in a terrible part of the cycle. All the banks are still trying to recover their capital bases. They're still trying to deal with the constant knock on the door for another regulatory inquisition, right? And all of that takes a tremendous amount of energy and expense. So, so I think on the financial side, it's going to happen a little slower, at least in the, the traditional firms, because the cost-benefit analysis of doing good data analytics on some existing data sets is always going to be more attractive when you're kind of under siege. That said, what's going on over, and we'll talk about some on the next panel, you know, what's going on over on the hedge fund side and what's going on on, you know, some of the fintech side is exciting cubed. Okay, I mean, in terms of really studying some big data sets and non-traditional data sets that are having you know, surprising to, to, the, to the point, you know, that ISA was making about how sometimes when you look at data because you never looked at it before, or you couldn't look at it before, and you get a different answer than the one that you were expecting or how things have been, I think we're starting to see a lot of that happening. And I do think that there's going to be some wildly successful trading strategies that come out of actually studying large sets but with low-lying fruit. I don't think we're talking about the... 12th derivative of fancy mining algorithms. We're talking about just, oh wow, look at that number staring at me. <laughs> you know, in this, at, when this data set speaks to me. So, so I, think, I think that there's some very exciting stuff over there. So I suppose, circling back to one of my earlier com comments, you have to figure out whether the hedge fund world excites you or slowly maneuvering that giant ship in the ocean and having an impact on a lot of people's lives excites you in terms of directing your own career. More questions from the audience now? OK. Anything else you want to ask or post? Two minutes I yeah. wanted to ask the panel. Do you have anything, if now you restart your career, from age 20, anything, one thing you think oh. you should uh, correct, or you you think that will change, or you improve, or maybe something, or something you think you did the most uh, correctly that really helped your career, either the negative one or the positive one? I would say for me, um, I dare to be a little bit different, and I dare to have a different opinion. And I, I think there's a there's a way to go into it, like like Tanya alluded to earlier, in the way you communicate, you have to be very humble. But you know, it's okay to have a different perspective, a different opinion, and a different approach than what's been done before. It's all about how you communicate it. And I think a lot of times when younger people go into larger corporations, they kind of get sucked into the mindset. And that is not really on the long term a value add, right? And so I would say that, you know, to people's points earlier, don't be as risk averse. It's okay to take risks. They just need to be calculated and smart. But um, I would say that definitely kind of stay true to, to yourself and your thinking and don't be afraid to, to take a different position because that's actually how we take business to the next level. We'll see. Similar vein, take risks even if you don't know in advance how smart they are. Um, <laughs> because a lot of times, if you can just get out of the same old situation into a new situation, you will find things that work so well for you that you didn't even know to look for there. 
Um, sometimes you just need to change things up for the sake of changing them up a bit. So don't let yourself um, get too comfortable. If you're very comfortable, look for a new problem to tackle where you are. See if you can maybe rotate to another division. Maybe you need to change jobs. Maybe you need to change um, your role somehow. Don't get too comfortable. That's also part of risk taking. You can't know in advance what all the benefits are going to be, but there is inevitably a benefit to being uncomfortable and being challenged at what you're doing. Um. I think my answer to that is that um, I'll just start from the perspective that just about everything I did in my career didn't exist when I was in my programs. And I, I want to repeat that. The things I did in my career and very successfully did not exist. So I think one of the things that I always try to advise people who are starting out is not to have on the blinders where you have, and women are incredible planners. Oh. I'm going to do this the first two years, and then I'm going to have my first kid. And I'm like, well, that's really interesting. Who are you going to have the kid with? Well, I haven't met him yet. <laughs> okay. And then after that, I'm going to go back, and then I'm going to get promoted. Then I'm going to have my second kid. And they have like these grand plans. And, and here's the area I'm going into. And it's the blinders, like you see, you know, that horses wear when they're on the city streets. And if you don't have your eyes open to watch, the opportunities stroll by. And they will stroll by all the time. New areas, new market changes, new startup firms that are created perhaps because of the regulatory inquisition. A lot of what's going on in Silicon Valley right now that I see is because the big established firms are so busy trying to deal with compliance that they can't spend their effort on new products. And so new products are being elsewhere. And so. So my suggestion is you really have to keep your eyes open to see those opportunities. And when they walk by, you have to say, wow, I, I want to try that, to Rosie's point. Or if you're a little bit more risk averse you know, and you see some activity going on somewhere, go volunteer. Just say, you know, I see that you guys are here until midnight every night. Obviously, they're there because there's business being done. Something exciting's going on. So if you're done at 5, go over there and say, can I help you for a few hours? See what that business is about. Um, you know, that, that worked for me. I mean, I'll say that in my very first uh, step was in mergers and acquisitions. And I was probably at First Boston for a week when there was a very young, uh, very young, I think he was an assistant vice president, Perella, was there late at night looking for people. And I ended up working on the very first M&A deal that, that was done in the firm. And there were four people in the group. I was the fourth one. So, so there's lots of opportunities that happen if you just pay attention to them and, and take the risk to go do it. If you want to be risk averse, like I said, then offer to do extra work. Um, and it was the same thing when derivatives came along, when the strategic and the big data, or when the opportunity you know, to do the things over here. And many of the others you've heard today, I think you'll hear a pretty consistent message that many of the things we did in our careers did not exist when we sat in your chair. So, so and we're don't not think, assigned to us. Right. And so don't think that you have to decide today to pick for your whole career, because there will be all kinds of new stuff constantly. Yeah. So. so to summarize, it's like to be proactive and to seize the opportunity. And trust me, women have great intuition and trust your intuition. I have really think that that's sometimes if you're risk averse, you started questioning yourself. But then on top of that, trust your intuition and just do it. That's probably many of the successful story here. Yep. Good yep. ending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.